Okay, everybody, thank you for joining. This is uh, cycle number eight. It's titled uh, More About Alcoholism. So as we continue to learn more about alcoholism and drug addiction, <clears throat> um, we're just going to keep going over a lot of the same things and keep making our way through this big book. We're on, we're finishing up. Um, there's a solution chapter. Um, it's going to be on page 29 today. We'll finish that up. And before we move on to the next chapter or more about alcoholism, we're going to go back to the doctor's opinion in the front of the book. That's where the cycle comes from. So we'll go through that. <clears throat> and then when we're done there, we'll move into the more about alcoholism chapter. So I like to keep everybody up to speed on what we're doing, our approach. And um, at the end of today's class, I like to spend some time on the mind piece up here and the lies that are coming in. And I have some scriptures that will help us understand the battle in the mind and how to fight back using God's mighty weapon. So I'm excited about that. Everything we're going over, you can apply with, with God's help and you can recover from alcoholism and drug addiction. So, I mean, it's very, very <clears throat> important stuff. So let's open in prayer and let's get started. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we turn this time over to you. We know that you want to use us as humans, God, to speak your truth, to be available, that we have encounters with you, Lord, and you save us and you, you relieve us from addiction, God, and we have to be available for you to use us to go and spread this message to others, the message that's in this big book, the message that's all through your Bible, Lord, that we want that you want to have an intimate relationship with us and treat our inside. And when we treat our inside, our spirits, our mind and body fo follow suit, and that that's how people recover and can stay recovered. So we give you thanks and praise for that. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> So how thankful am I that I was able to recover from drug addiction and alcoholism? And if I stay in these three parts that we talk about with my relationship with God, keeping my connection with God, renewing my mind every morning, um, looking to him, asking direct to direct my thinking so that I can, I can be spiritually fit, so that um, I can be around like-minded people, take my physical bodies to meetings and to Bible studies and to church and to things like that, that I can find a sponsor and work through the steps. It's all laid out right here, but you have to actually put action. It's a spiritual program of action. You need to work the steps. And when you've gone over these steps, that you find someone and you take them through the steps and you can disciple people through the word, through church, but you gotta work with others. So staying in those three parts, will you will stay recovered. Like that is that is what this whole class is set up for, so people can know that they can stay recovered and relapse is not, does not have to be part of the picture. Absolutely not. You can stay off of this cycle for good and for all. And that's what we're talking about. That's why we're doing these classes. That information has to be out there. And uh, I'm living proof of it, and so are a lot of other people. So <clears throat> let's pick up where we left off at the very bottom of page 28. It says, in the following chapter, there appears an explanation of alcoholism. Okay? As we understand it, then a chapter addressed to the agnostic. Okay, so this next chapter is going to spend breaking down alcoholism. So we're going to read the first paragraph of this next chapter. But after today, we're going to go to the doctor's opinion in the front of the book where this cycle comes from. And then after we do this doctor's opinion, we're going to pick up where we left off on the chapter more about alcoholism. So let's see what the first paragraph says on page 30, chapter 3, more about alcoholism. Let's break this down and see if we can see it in the cycle so we can know what we're dealing with. Most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. You see, you got to stop right there. Step one, not because I'm saying it, but because you know for yourself, from your experience, you can see your experience on this cycle, living your life on this cycle, you have to know for yourself and, and accept step one and never forget step one that you are completely powerless to stay off the cycle on your own. You are completely powerless because you have this weird mental obsession, this lie that keep telling our sick mind that we can control this somehow. So we keep putting the first drink and first drug back in our body. 
Like you have to know how powerless you are against that. And you can have no reservations that your life is unmanageable even and will stay unmanageable. It doesn't matter if you move or, or what you do, but your life is unmanageable because of the spiritual condition you have, an internal condition called spiritual malady. And it manifests itself in being restless, irritable, discontent, thoughts of uselessness, um, self-conscious, always in my head. I have this self-centered outlook on life. I'm always blaming others. I have a lot of fear and these things. So my life will always stay unmanageable no matter what I do until I address the spiritual condition, my internal condition. So this is understanding alcoholism and drug addiction. It's understanding the spiritual malady and it's rooted in the mind because why does our sick minds keep saying that we're going to somehow control it and be able to, to handle that that uh, alcohol weed whatever any type of hard drug and control it like a normal person when our history tells us that we always go on a spree we always have truth and consequences and then we have to deal with emergent remorseful making firm resolution and that firm resolution what always turns into a broken promise and then here we go on this merry-go-round over and over and over again. Aren't you tired of it? Are you tired of being on the merry-go-round? Have you realized that life is absolutely not fun to live and you keep banging your head against the wall? The big book is an example of somebody who has a headache and grabs a hammer and smacks his head with a hammer. Like that's going to help. Your life's already unmanageable. You've been on the cycle. You're, you, things aren't going well for you. Why would you continue to drink and use? You know it's not working for you anymore. It's like taking a hammer and cracking yourself over the head. This is insanity. That's why we're trying to get to the bottom of what's going on here. Aren't you tired of staying on this cycle? Because there's ways to get off. You can see that we have our website there on the screen, and you can contact us. There's contact numbers there. We have a, a year-long program here at the New Life Dream Center in Bethel Island. If you are a good fit for us and you're willing and ready, uh, we can take you in. We have a men's home and a woman's home. We can get, go over this stuff into where it really sinks into your heart to the point where you fall in love with God, your creator. And that process, um, it's a year-long program. So you can contact us through that if you're tired of living your life on this cycle. There's a better way. That's what I'm here doing, taking my time to put this out there because someone took time to do that for me. And there's a better way of living. So we want to understand What's actually going on? What is alcoholism? What is drug addiction? Okay? No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellow. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. We don't want to admit, you know, our pride is so hard for us to admit that something's wrong with me. I'm not like my friends. I'm not like my uncles. I'm not like my cousins. They seem to be able to drink and control it somewhat and show up to work. You see, I did that for a time, but I lost all control. Now I don't even have a choice whether I continue to drink or use because my spiritual malady acts up so bad that this insane thought that it's a good idea to put something else in my body just rules my life, that mental obsession to keep using even when it's not fun. And I need God's help to lift this mental obsession. But it's hard for me because of my pride to admit I need help, to be willing to listen to go do something different with my life, to be uncomfortable. I don't want to admit that I, I'm different from other people to where my buddies, my, my, my childhood buddies can go to a ball game and drink some beers, some good IPAs, and I can't touch it. It's not worth it to me. I don't need that. I get filled up with the God now and the things of God and doing things like this. I, I don't need to do that stuff anymore, but if I'm not careful, if I'm not spiritually fit, if I'm not working with others, if I'm not doing the things I need to do, my sick mind will tell me I can have one of those IPAs. I mean, I haven't even tried some of those new crafted beers, you know? My sick mind is gonna tell me, hey, that's a crafted beer right there, man. That's, that's top of the line, you know? And then there I go off to the races. I'm having some beers that day, and whoever knows how long, I'm going to be popping some Vicodin soon after that. And then I'll be back shooting dope, because that's what I really want to do. So I had to admit that I was different. I, I have to accept step one. I can't convince anybody to accept step one. You have to accept step one. You are powerless. You can never touch a substance again. 
Your sick mind may be telling you, I just get enough clean time and I don't go and do that. I just do this, you know, I just drink some wine, some fancy wine with dinner. I'll be okay. You know, that's what our mind tells us. That has to be smashed out. Okay. So we have to be very clear on this. Step one, you convince yourself that that's you. I can't convince you. They convince you. So reading on page 30 on uh, chapter three, more about alcoholism. Let's see. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. Here we go. It's repeating itself over and over again because we need this. Think about it. All we have to do is not pick up that first drink and that first drug. That's all we have to do. But our sick mind, if we aren't spiritually fit and doing the things we need to do to stay spiritually fit and, and treat our internal condition, time goes on, that spiritual condition manifests in restless, irritable, discontented, right? Feelings of boredom. What about boredom? You know how many, how many times boredoms took people out? Right? All these things, fear, all these things are going on. Frustrations coming in, depression, anxiety, all this stuff is hitting you. And then the thought comes and we go ahead and put it back in our body. Right? Thinking what? This great obsession is that somehow it's going to work out good for us. We know that it's caused so many problems in our life. It's not fun anymore, but still we struggle with this great obsession. It's talking about this persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. Wow, right out of the big book. This persistent illusion, this lie that we're going to control it this time, regardless of all the other evidence, that thing has to, you need God's help with that. If you're not doing what you need to do every day, if you don't stay spiritually fit, if you're not watching out for these lies and fighting back with God's mighty weapon, catching those rebellious thoughts when the selfish desires crop up, you need to put those things to death. Yeah, they come, and we're going to touch on this later. I have scriptures to back this up. These thoughts come, right? But when they come, you can't agree with them. You have to know how to fight back using God's mighty weapons to capture those rebellious thoughts and redirect your focus back to the truth, to helping others, the word of God. Um, these things, like, they're going to come. They're going to crop up. We all have sin in us. We all have selfish desires. But you cannot agree with them until the point where you're devising a plan around them because that's when human reasoning kicks in. And then before you know it, you're taking action on it. You cannot take action. Why would you put something back in your body? Why do people relapse? Because of a place where we know it ain't fun anymore, but we don't understand what's going on. We have to understand alcoholism and drug addiction. It's a spiritual thing. Why do people keep going back? You see? So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand it. But you have to accept step one. You are powerless against going back. You will actually lose the power of choice in going back if what? If you don't stay spiritually fit. So you need God's help to do that. And staying in the three parts like we talk about all the time. But if you need more clarity around this stuff, contact us. My phone number is on there. So are some of the other workers' phone numbers. Contact us. We'll set up a meeting. Like you don't have to live the way you're living. You don't have to continue to relapse. It's, it's, it's avoidable. But you're going to need God's help. Um, so there's this crazy illusion. And it's so astonishing because many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. Like, how crazy is this? What are we up against? Like, we will pursue it and pursue it and pursue it until insanity, where we, we're literally walking around crazy or we're locked up somewhere or we actually physically die. And we just keep at it, keep at it. Blame gaming, our selfish outlook, like the thoughts come, our spirit is so sick that our, we're so insane that we keep going back and put stuff in our body staying on this cycle and we will pursue it until insanity or death but there's there's a better way that it doesn't have to be that way like how important is this information 
You know, why, why are we continuing to live a way that we don't even want to live anymore? Why would we, why would we con continue to relapse? It's like, we, we got to stop this. And we have a clear-cut way to stop it. Let me continue on. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. There's that first step. You have to decide. You have to know. Your experience should tell you, but me telling you that ain't going to do nothing. You have to understand this and remind yourself every single morning with your quiet time with God, saying, telling God, your will, God, not my will. Help me just today, God. Help me to look at things the way you look at things. Direct my thinking. When I'm agitated through, through this day, and I do this every day, pause and ask him for his help. You know, like I'm, I'm powerless without your help, God. I, my life's unmanageable. I will keep going back onto this cycle without you without seeking you daily. You know, you have to decide that for yourself, right? Because we don't want people to continue to relapse. We don't want you to drink yourself to death. We don't want you to cause heartache to yourself or to your family members. Like we put our family through a lot, all that unnecessary, but it comes through surrender and never forgetting step one. So it said to our innermost selves, that we had to admit that we were real alcoholic drug addicts, okay? This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people, or presently maybe, has to be smashed. The delusion, what's a delusion? It's a lie. It's deception. That that great obsession that we can control it and drink like normal people. We keep chasing it, keep chasing it, even though our experience tells us otherwise. We need to be reminded these things every day by God and by working with others and staying around like-minded people, going to meetings, all these things we talk about. This delusion that we chase and pursue into, into uh, insanity or death that we can somehow control it. Like It's not going to completely destroy us. That has to be broke. That's that mental obsession that only the power of God can lift. It's this weird thing, because when we're not okay spiritually inside, this stuff manifests to where our sick mind tells us we can take that first drink, that first drug. This is insane. Okay. So it, it needs to be smashed. That needs to be smashed. If you have any reservation, about still being able to drink and control it, just smoke weed or whatever. That needs to be smashed. And every morning you re, you re-smash that. Okay? That's what I do. Every single morning. Never can I put something in my body. It's safer that way. Okay. Okay. We're almost done with this little part. Um, we alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. You see that? We know that no real alcoholic or drug addict ever recovers control. So let's smash that thought, that mental obsession, that I'll be able to control it somehow. I lie to myself, here's how I'll control it. Here's what I'll do different up here in my thought life with my human reasoning. We have to capture those rebellious thoughts and make them obedient to God's word, to the truth. Bring that before God. And smash that crazy, insane thought every day that I cannot, and I'll never regain control. Like, this is step one. I'm powerless. I'm unmanaged. My life is unmanageable. I'll never regain control. Okay? All of us felt at times that we were regaining control. But such intervals, usually brief, were never be followed by still less control. So, we get removed for a time, right? We get some head knowledge. We start feeling better mentally and physically. We get out of the program. We get out of jail. We move. We get a new job. We start building things back in our life. It looks as if we're, get, we're gaining some control because we let our guard down. We start having a couple beers. Hey, look, things are better. I'm having a couple beers. Well, for the first couple times, you just have a couple beers. You're like, look at this. I think I can drink like a normal person. 
But before long, you find out the hard way, you do not have no control. You're back on a spree, then the truth and consequence comes where you, then once again you are drinking and using yourself to death. You have emerged remorseful once again, make a firm resolution, and here we go, potentially back on the merry go round of this cycle. We don't want any more broken promises. At times it seems as if maybe we are getting control. Look, I'm holding it together. You know, I'm even showing up to work for my new job, you know. Maybe maybe it, it, it always fails. We have to smash that crazy idea that we're gonna we're gonna be able to control it. And that's what it keeps repeating over and over again. Every morning of your life, you need to smash it. You got to. Okay? And what it says, it's usually brief, right? Uh, we're inevitably followed by still less control. Which, which led in time to pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. It's like consequence. That control I thought I was having, getting all hyped about, I found out the hard way once again. I have no control. It seemed as if I was for a time. It's what it's warning against. And then you're back on a spree because you have no control. And this consequence, oh my gosh, how painful. The guilt, the shame, starting over, having to make more promises. After those, bro those promises became broken, like you don't want to face what comes after a relapse. It's so hard, right? But if we don't smash that idea that we can control it, it's just coming once again. I can't stand relapses. They're not necessary. They cause so much harm to the person and everybody who's connected to that person. It's a very selfish thing. But if you don't know any better, you gotta work the step. You gotta stay connected to God. You gotta every day ask him for his help that he keeps people sober. God keeps people sober. You bring their physical body around like-minded people three, four times a week. You find a sponsor, work all the steps. Be uncomfortable, do everything that's suggested. Stay in your Bible, be connected with the church. Work with someone, disciple someone, sponsor someone, take someone through the steps, be available, and you will not relapse. 100% guarantee. That's what we keep talking about here. We're not wasting our breath or time. You will not relapse, but there are things that you need to do. It's all laid out in the big book in the Bible, and we will help whoever Contact us. We will help you walk through some of this as we're helping people already. And I hope all of you smash the idea that you can control it one day and also smash the idea that you can just freely take what was given and you don't have to work with others. No, 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 no. You must work with others. Okay. I just follow the, the guidelines. I follow the directions. Okay. So. We are convinced to a man that alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. Over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. So this is a progressive illness. Alcoholism is a spiritual disease. It's rooted in the mind and it affects the body. Because once we put something in our body, we true alcoholic addicts have a, a weird reaction to it. When some people can stop and control it, we don't have control once it's in the body. So don't put it in the body. But we keep telling ourselves we can't control it because our mind is so insane and sick. When what? When our spirit isn't treated and we're not spiritually okay, connected with God, working with others, being around like-minded people. You understand? Like, there's a real answer for this stuff is you got to understand alcoholism and drug addiction. That's why we're spending the time every week to go to go over it. A lot of people don't understand what's what actually going on behind the scenes. So we're just nailing it, right? And it will never get better. That's what the malady is, the spiritual malady. It's a chronic disease that never gets better. It gets worse over time. The malady will never get better. You have to treat it every day because you have a daily reprieve to treat your spiritual malady with your relationship with God and the things of God, working with others. All these things that treat your spirit. You only have a daily reprieve. 
because that will never get better. That's why you can move, change your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your job, but the malady, your internal condition goes with you. And if you don't treat it every day, it's going to manifest itself into these different ways where it'll grab a hold of you and your mind, you'll just take a lie and then take action and put something back in your body. And you're just staying on this cycle. And I don't like when people are on this cycle because I was on it for decades and I don't like it. What time is it? Okay, got about two more minutes. If, if we take that long. Okay, come back with me now as we finish up. There's the solution chapter. Um, at the bottom of page 28, it said, it was talking about the chapter we just started reading. It explains alcoholism. And then the next chapter after that would be addressed to the agnostic. Okay? It says, many who once were in this class are now among our members. Surprisingly enough, we find such convictions no great obstacle to a spiritual experience. So what is it saying? If you're agnostic, atheist, or agnostic, agnostic is atheist, there is no God. Very few people are, are atheists. They may say they are, but deep down, times get rough, watch them cry out to God. A lot of people are agnostic. Well, they say, I, I admit there's probably a God, you know, an intelligent designer. Look at all the creation. Look at the humans. Look at everything. There's so much proof for God. But that's where I stop. I don't know about having a personal relationship with this God I can't see and letting this God direct my life and all that stuff. So there's a chapter on agnostic, which is like, okay, maybe there's a God. But see, that was me. I, I, I was sure there was a God, but I never had spent the time seeking God. And I, I didn't consider and had an open mind and willingness that God could do for me what I can't do for myself. I couldn't stop using. I couldn't stay off this cycle. I could not do it no matter what. And some people told me, well, God can. I said, oh, what does that mean? Like, how, what do you mean? And then I was just open to it. This much open mindedness, this much willingness, and you will see that God will do for you what you can't do for yourself. And that's where faith comes in, and it's just amazing. You know, you come into the realm of the spirit. You know, your spiritual eyes are open. Some of the stuff we've been talking about, it's absolutely amazing. And so I was agnostic at once. And what's crazy is I can still be agnostic. We talk about it, you know, me and my wife talk about it, that when I'm not trusting God still, why would I not trust God? Everything he's done for me in my life, and still something happens, and we fear creeps in, and we, oh my gosh, you know. It's like that's being agnostic. Because God either is or he isn't. He's either real or he isn't. Who's come through for me all these years, eight years later? It's been God in miraculous ways. And I'm being agnostic still because I'm not trusting God. So I want you, you, you need to trust God with your life. And, and I know it's a process, and that's why um, that's what it says. It just, we just, it's progress, not perfection. But man, being agnostic. So we're going to go over that in one of the chapters as well. But that doesn't stop someone from having a spiritual experience, you see? And the crazy thing about addiction and, and alcoholism and drug addiction, how low it, it gets us and how miserable we become, all that ends up being a blessing because it put me in a position where I was actually willing to listen. See, I would never listen before. No one could tell me nothing. I knew everything. But I was so beat down that I was in a place of submission finally, that I was just open-minded and willingness enough to listen. And I'm sure glad that God helped me in that process because here I sit today. But uh, being agnostic or atheist, if you just are open-minded and you're done with the way your life has been looking, that's the important part. You have to be so sick of how your life has been and, and sick of being on this cycle and ready to try something different. And it's going to work, you know? So you could be agnostic or atheist or whatever, but if you're this much open-minded, you will have a spiritual experience and you will come to know God. And everything is going to change. So, page 29, as we finish up this chapter. <laughs> Further on, clear-cut directions are given showing how we recover. What do you think? Did you hear what that said? There are clear-cut directions in this book that will show you how to recover. The first 
164 pages of the big book will show you step by step, direction, direction, how to recover. You say, well, this all sounds pretty cool. I'm tired of the way my life is. And I don't know about this God thing, but if you say maybe I should try it, I'm kind of out of options and, and maybe this could work. But how does it work? I'm telling you how it works. There's clear cut directions in here. You have to follow through with the clear cut direction. You have to actually work the steps and get uncomfortable. You actually have to come somewhere and listen. Get disciple. Be open to God. Be open to listen. Be teachable. There's clear cut direction. What are you doing? You say, well, I've tried AA. I've tried different things. But did you work all the steps? No, I didn't work all the steps. There you go. Don't say you tried it and it didn't work because you didn't do what you needed to do. Follow directions. There's clear cut directions. Actually do it. And then once you do it, take time with someone else and go through it with somebody else and watch what it does for your spirit and your connection with God and your recovery. Okay? Follow directions. There's clear cut directions in here, it says. These are followed by 42 personal experience. After page 164, it goes into some personal testimonies and experience that people had that are now recovered. And they tell you from their point of view how they recovered. So that's after the first 164 pages. It's saying this, it's laying it out right here. You know, you're either at the end of your rope and interested in this, this stuff that will actually work, that I'm giving you my personal testimony that it actually works. You're either going to do it or you're not. You know, and don't sit around and act like, um, well, I can't change and I've tried AA and I've tried the church and all this stuff, but you haven't really done what you need to do. And then don't sit around and say, well, I can't change. I can't stop all this. I can't stop all that. You have to take action and it will work. Okay. And those stories, it says each individual in the, in the personal stories describes in his own language and from his, his own point of view, the way he established his relationship with God. Man, you just got to start somewhere with God. Be open-minded and willing. These give a fair cross-section of our membership and a clear-cut idea of what has actually happened in their lives. So contact us, like I was saying earlier. If you want, if you needed to come into the New Life Dream Center, come in. Or I can get you into another program and you're done with the way you're living. Like, we can give you clear-cut like our experience and what happened with us, how God can take over, take control over your life and change you from the inside out. And, and this, this stuff is miracles. I'm surprised that's not talked about more. Like what's happening here is miracle stuff. And it's happening other places too. But I'm just, it blows my mind it's not talked about more. And it blows my mind that a lot of times we can't see when we're in the moment what's happening, what God's actually doing. It's so trippy. It's, it goes a lot with just not being able to see, like your spiritual eyes, you can't see really what's going on. It's, 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 it's amazing. Um, last paragraph. We hope no one will consider these self-revealing accounts in bad taste. Right? Like, don't have con contempt prior before investigation. Like, don't think, oh, wow, well, you know, don't be like me and be so skeptical about, like, God and what he can do. People are telling you that God is what fixed them and you're in trouble and you're out of options. Maybe you should be open-minded and willing to find out for yourself what these people are saying. That's what finally happened to me. And there's all this hope and guidance that you'll find in the big book and of course the Bible. Okay, so don't have contempt prior to investigation. Find out for yourself. Our hope is that many alcoholic men and women desperately in need will see these pages. And we believe that it is only by fully disclosing ourselves and our problems that they will be persuaded to say, yes, I am one of them too. I must have this thing. So that's our hope to spread freely what we've been so freely given. Spend time with people, tell them how it happened, that it was God. Break down alcoholism. That's a spiritual malady that you have to treat every day. And the, the workings of the mind and the body, you stay in the three parts, that you can stay recovered. That you only have a daily reprieve to seek God every day and, and take the necessary actions. Work all the steps. And then in a little while, work them all again. And take somebody through the steps. 
Spend time discipling people with the word of God. Go over the scripture with them. You know, be held accountable. Get involved in a church and stay, stay involved, you know. Um, so that's our hope is that, you know, people know this has been out since like 1929, 1930 when this was written. And you want to talk when the Bible was written, way before that. Over 2,000 years, the Old Testament even longer than that. This has been around since 1930, and people are baffled by alcoholism and drug addiction. They don't even read this because it points to God and breaks down what's going on internally and how to recover and stay recovered. So why are people relapsing? If you have it word for word, step by step, the clear cut directions on how to recover and stay recovered, why are people relapsing? 1930, everybody's baffled by addiction still, you see? So we're going to close with a couple scriptures. Next week, we'll pick up with the doctor's opinion, and we'll keep going over this stuff and repeating this stuff. This stuff really matters because people should not be relapsing. But a lot of people don't know this information, so that's what we're trying to do. We're attempting to do our part and keep putting the information out there, be available to work with people because the people should not be relapsing still, okay? Because there's a clear-cut way of, of 100% guaranteeing that you will not relapse. All right, now, one of the pieces, you got the spiritual component, the spiritual malady, you got the mind, the will, the emotions, the soul, the soul piece, and you got the body. So let's spend a little time on this mind piece because we can sure get goofy up here. Why does this mental obsession, these lies come in that tell us that we can control it when our experience tells us otherwise? Why do we keep falling for this? Given enough time up here in our, in our minds with human reasoning and justification, we take this, we play with it, and if we play with it too long, we just take action on it. We even lose the ability to choose whether or not we're going to do it. That is such a mental twist. It's such a trip. So I wanted to go over some of these verses because it kind of helps break it down how we can fight back against this. So... In John chapter 11, uh, chapter 8, verse 11, and also in chapter 5, verse 14, um, Jesus heals two people. Uh, one is a woman who got caught in adultery in, in John chapter 8, verse 11. And he says, whoever has sin, cast the first stone, right? You may know some of this story. And then he tells her at the end, now go and sin no more. Like, like so that got me thinking, like, go and sin no more. So what does that mean? Like, go and sin no more. Like, you know, we, we know in 1 John chapter 1, 8, it said, we are a liar if we say we have no sin in us. So sin is still in our body, and Jesus is saying, go and sin no more. But Jesus does not expect this woman to just lay down her, 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 her sinful nature and selfish desires not to crop up, right? These things are still going to happen. That's what happens with these lies that come at us, this mental obsession saying that we can control our drinking. Like, we, if we get connected with God and we stay in the three parts and we're recovered and walking, these things aren't going to stop coming, right? Selfish desires are still going to crop up, right? These lies are still going to come. And if we give our mind enough time to justify them, we will take action on them. That's what we're learning. So when Jesus says, go and sin no more, that doesn't mean that you're not going to be tempted, that thoughts aren't going to come in. We know in um, John chapter 6, 2, that when Judas was getting ready to betray Jesus, that Satan entered through a thought, put a thought in Judas's heart to go and betray Jesus. So thoughts are gonna come. Selfish desires are gonna crop up. Let's read a verse that states it perfectly right now. James chapter one, verses 12 through 15. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. See, so the desires are going to crop up. The thoughts are going to come but you do not play with it up here in your thought life. When you give sin room to grow in your thought life, then you will conceive 
which is devising a plan around it. It's, it's another word for conceive is become pregnant with sin. And then when you give birth to sin, it's actually death. It's compared to a stillborn, giving birth to a stillborn. Like the sin is death in your mind. You painted it up to be this and that. We lied to ourselves. We told ourselves we're going to control it. It's going to be different this time. We justified it up here. So the, the selfish desires are going to still come. The thoughts are going to still come. But when you spend time with it and devise a plan around those thoughts and those selfish desires, that's when sin has time to conceive. And then you can actually take action on that sin, which is death equals death. Do you see that? Like that's so powerful. Like we can't fool ourselves. The thoughts are going to still come. Our selfish desires are going to crop. But what we cannot do is spend time with those thoughts, devising a plan around those thoughts, conceiving, giving, giving um, sin a chance to conceive in our thought life. Right? So that's super powerful. Let's read a couple more verses and then we'll close. Romans 8, 13. For if you live by the dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. So when they crop up, if you devise a plan around it and you give in to it, you give you actually take action on it, you give birth to sin, the consequences and all these things then you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. But when they do crop up, like that verse that said, if you put it to death through the power of God's spirit, through the cross, you put those thoughts and those selfish desires to death, then you're, you're following Jesus in that way. That's what Jesus did. When he was tempted in, in, the, in the wilderness, Satan put a thought in him. He was hungry. He was tempted to turn those stones into bread. But he put those thoughts and those temptations to death. And he threw scripture back at it. So that wasn't didn't give a chance to give birth. You see, if you live by your sinful desires and you don't put them to death, you give it time to conceive a plan around it, then you will be led into sin. That's what Jesus was saying. Go and sin no more. Not that sin wasn't going to come after you. A thought and selfish desires were going to still crop up. That's everybody. Sin's in all of us. But to devise a plan around it and conceive around that thought or that selfish desire turns into action, and then you give birth to death, which is sin. You see that? But Jesus says in uh, Luke 9, 23, he says, if you deny yourself, so when those selfish desires crop up and the thoughts come to lead, take action in, the, in that selfish way, you deny yourself, you pick up your cross, you put to death those thoughts and those desires, that's a follower of Jesus. This is, this, is, this is beyond powerful. That's when you're a follower of Jesus. You know, depending on his power. Uh, Galatians 5.24. Um, I'll read that one. Um, Col Colossians 3.5. Uh, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly and nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, Evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. So put those things to death when they crop up. Jesus says, go and sin no more. That don't mean that sin ain't going to come after us. Temptation, selfish desires are going to crop up. Thoughts are going to come. When they do crop up, you put them to death. You deny yourself the selfish desires. You bear the cross. Put those thoughts and desires to death. That's following Jesus. That's so awesome. So, um... Galatians 5.24. Okay. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. So, the passion, desires of our sinful nature, when it crops up, because we all have sin, sin's going to come after us all. If we say we don't have sin in us, we're a liar. 1 John 1, eight. But when it does crop up, we understand through the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel and the word of God that those desires are nailed to the cross. We don't have to give in to them. We don't give it time to um, de de uh, come up with a plan around them and conceive a plan, become pregnant with sin till we actually take action and give birth to death. Like this is super powerful. That's how we can stay off this cycle. And we know when we're working the spiritual program of action, we're going through every step, 
We're staying around like-minded people. We're working with others, taking people to the steps. And then we come and we start breaking down scripture like this, using God's mighty weapons to fight back with these lies, this crazy obsession that we can control it somehow that keeps us on this cycle. We can come after this stuff with the power of God. Uh, I'm going to close right there. There's many more verses that I can put to this, but it's 30 minutes and we need to, we need to close. So we'll pick up um, on the doctor's opinion um, next week, and I will have many more chances to use scripture to break down the battle in the mind because you can walk in freedom. You get the big book in the Bible working hand in hand, you're unstoppable, absolutely unstoppable. So thanks for joining. Have a blessed week. We'll see you next week. How long was that?